afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Professor Carlos uh, De Sena. I'm acting director of the Institute for the Global for the Study of Global Racial Justice uh, in New Brunswick um, at Rutgers University, and I am really um, delighted to welcome you to this special event um, to um, celebrate the release of uh, the book, The Virus Touch: Theorizing Epidemic B uh, Media by Professor. Uh, Bishnu Priya Ghosh uh, from um, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, before I do a brief introduction of our speaker and my um, uh, co-conspirator in the development of the series and um, you know fellow interlocutor uh, with Bishnu this afternoon, I just wanna tell you a little bit about uh, the Viral Vital series, uh, which developed out of um, the ISDRJ, as we use the acronym at New Brunswick. Um, and we started with um, a, a, an encounter uh, among AIDS activists um, and folks working both in AIDS and um, in the coronavirus epidemic in uh, world on World AIDS Day in 2022. Uh, the Vital Vital series is a series that attempts to um, think about the long historical roots of um, the kind of moment that we're living through now, which for some uh, appears to be a post-COVID moment, but most of us realize that we're still very much in COVID time, um, in asking questions about the degree to which system, people, communities um, have managed to learn um, learn to um, develop uh, strategies for survival, for care, uh, for community building um, in times of pandemic, and also to what degree um, the long historical memory of crises such as the AIDS crisis um, are shaping the way in which we organize, the way in which we resist, and the way in which uh, we negotiate uh, the virality of the kind of vitality that we experience today. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna um, go directly into an introduction of our speaker. And then uh, the way we would like to um, structure the time we spend together is by having Vishnu speak to us about her book um, and, and a presentation that's very much inspired by the book, but also moving in a slightly different uh, direction, which I believe um, many will find uh, really interesting. Uh, then uh, my my colleague and friend, uh, Pato Hebert from NYU will be um, it, with me, joining me in uh, responding to Vishnu, and then we will open up for questions from the floor, whatever it gets called these days when it happens on Zoom, um, and however it gets to us, and maybe through chat or maybe some, through other means. So, um, professional, uh, Professor uh, Bis uh, Bishnu Priya Ghosh is a professor of English and Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, she's the author of Global Icons, uh, Apertures to the Popular, which is also published by um, Duke University Press and a co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to Media at Risk and Risk, which is, I guess, um, a, a kind of prelude to some of the work that um, gets carried out beautifully in um, the book, The Virus Touch. Um, she, uh, with a doctorate from Northwestern University, uh, Professor Ghosh is um, ha teaches environmental media and global post-colonial studies um, at UC Santa Barbara. Much of her early scholarly work interrogated the relations between the global and the post-colonial area studies and transnational cultural studies, popular mass and elite cultures. Um, while publishing essays on literary, cinematic and visual culture in several collections and journals such as Boundary 2, Journal of Post-Colonial Studies, Public Culture and Screen, um, in her first two books, uh, Gauche focused on contemporary elite and popular cultures of globalization. Uh, when born across literary cosmopolitics in the contemporary Indian novel, addressed the dialectical relations between emerging global markets and literatures reflexively marked as post-colonial, and global icons, apertures to the popular, which is a two, two, 2011 publication, turned to visual popular culture as it constitutes the global. One of the things that I find really striking about Professor Ghosh's, um, the, the, the work that get, gets carried out in, um, in the virus touch is um, that Professor Ghosh is an English professor um, 
at moving in a field that uh, I, as an as a former English major, uh, would never have imagined uh, would be within the purview of the kind of work that literary cultural critics uh, do. So I'm very excited to kind of um, engage in the discussion of the literary and the status of it in the context of your work as we go forward. Um, and I will introduce briefly um, Professor Pato Hebert, who is an associate arts professor and chair um, at uh, the Tisch School of the Arts Department of Art and Public Policy, where he started um, uh, serving as chair in 2020, but has been um, has worked and taught since 2012. Um, Pato Hebert is a visual artist, uh, educator, and organizer. And one of the main reasons I thought it was very uh, appropriate to have Pato um, join us today is that Vishnu actually writes about Pato's work. And so it gives an opportunity for one of the, um, the creatives, the artists um, engaging in the, in the visual and performance and public arts work uh, the visual analyze to kind of engage and um, uh, perform this sort of wonderful um, dialogue that we look forward to. Um, Hebert's artwork explores the challenges and possibilities of interconnectedness. He is particularly interested in space and place, spirituality and ecology, pedagogy and progressive praxis. He works with photography, graphic design, sculpture, installation, light, text, performance, and socially engaged uh, forms. His work appears in museums and galleries, as well as community spaces, schools, public architecture, and unexpected nodes of circulation. He often works in collaboration with fellow artists, writers, educators, young people, and community members to create new forms and meaning. Um, so what we're gonna do at this point is I'm gonna turn over turn this over to Professor Ghosh, who will, um, well, carry out her presentation and then um, I will signal to you, um, I maybe in chat or some other way, I try to signal that, that you have five minutes when we're at the 35 minute mark. And then um, we'll follow with some responses and engagement from the two of us. Um, and then um, we'll open it up to the audience. So thank you and uh, looking forward to this talk. Okay, let me start sharing my screen. And yes. Uh, so thank you, Carlos, for that uh, introduction. And I will follow up your uh, incitement to say a little bit about how I got here. And it's also a real pleasure to be in conversation with Pato in many ways. The topic I chose today is um, a response to some of his work in uh, photographing his breath that I talk about uh, in The Virus Touch. Um, so I think the thing I get asked most is how did a postcolonial theorist come to be writing this book? Um, and, uh, you know, this started way back in 2000, actually right past 9-11, where many of us were actually thinking about this post-surveillance 9-11 era where, you know, a lot of people from the global south were, you know, uh, considered risky and there was the segregation of populations and so on and so forth. And that's when I organized this residency on media and risk, that how is risk, which is coming harm, imagined mediatically. And my part was to think about biological risk or communities that had been targeted as biologically risky. And this was driven actually by um, along uh, my generational losses of the HIV AIDS community, but I had been working with activist organizations uh, in India. And um, so both of these things came together in a sub supposed essay that I was supposed to write. And what I found very disturbing that I was hearing after the retrovirals had come out that the AIDS crisis was over, whereas where I was, I live one foot in India, I was hearing a very different story there because these organizations dealt with really low income, historically disenfranchised communities. And so I began to ask, well, how did people perceive epidemics? What did it mean to actually be living with AIDS when you didn't have access, regular access to meds or you were migrating or your job wasn't secure and so on and so forth? And then I began to think about how these self-directed grassroots communities, as we know from uh, the U.S. context, 
actually made what is called managed HIV happen. So that was sort of the beginning of the book. And then I fell into a series of, into this company. It came to roost in my book, which is the last one you see there. But I can't ever think of it without thinking about the ecology of now 75 books on HIV AIDS as a recent pandemic books event characterized it that came out during the last three years. So it's worth thinking about why we're returning to this. So as I began looking at the discrepant uh, experiences of living with HIV, the scientific constitution of pathogenic viruses was the first stop for examining, uh, examining the sort of the relay between expert knowledge formations and on the ground practices. So for instance, something like uh, the, the blood test means very different in a clinical setting of a blood processing lab and something very different in a doctor's office. So I began to think about this and uh, looking at unusual media like the PCR test that stabilizes X number of viral particles in Y millimeters of blood to provide you an accurate reading of infection. For our purposes today, we can think of the blood datum from PCR tests as a media form that technically and aesthetically composes an object that is virus particles within a particular milieu that is blood. Bringing these practices into the domain of media studies was one thing, and I came to theorize epidemic media as those media forms that make perceptible the multiscalar viral emergence that is an epidemic. So I won't discuss all of the slides, but, but they'll be complementary to what I say. What became increasingly clear in this effort is that what went into proper compositions that yielded the cleanest signal and what was kept at bay, partitioned away as noise, error, or redundancy. Now, if we think about how quality blood data and a clean blood sample is extracted from the raw specimens, vials of blood that comes to the clinical lab every day, we get, get at what I mean by this technical aesthetic composition. And these this goes to why I think a literary person could actually do this. The specific pathogen, HIV-1 RNA, and a specific milieu, the individual's interior milieu, uh, ensures you kind of compose those two for certain kind of accuracy. This milieu must stop at the epidermal limit, at the limit of your skin, or else the sample would be contaminated or more worryingly, contaminate. So here's a terrible picture I took of myself, but I'll offer it to make this point that one of the things that struck me while I was in this blood processing lab for a while with the gloves, wipes, hazmat suit, all the safety protocols, which told me that there were these nested social and ecological milieus beyond the patient's body. These nested environments returned in the medical file as demographic data on a group or a neighborhood or as epidemiological data, agents and mutations. So it's something was being kept at bay. So one of my research sites was Cape Town, actually Kailitsha, this a town right bordering Cape Town, and the medical, uh, the Medicines on Frontiers uh, mobile clinics there. And if you look at the little patient card there, the S is sputum. So one of the problems there is the disease milieu. So you have the tuberculosis uh, bacteria simultaneously there with HIV. And this creates a kind of a righteous uh, um, entanglement of biological agents that often degrade the cleanest sample. So this is what I mean about these nested and cascading milieus. This noise, however, illuminates the conditions of existence for the medium, that is the greater milieu from which the sample is plucked. And this will become important in the talk. Turning noise to error and redundancy, we can apprehend that, that beyond that other place of time and infection. The media theoretical question for me then was, how do technical and aesthetic compos uh, compositions direct and influence epidemic experiences? They're in shaping interventions in acute infectious disease emergence. But what are the stakes then of pursuing what is partitioned away? What is improper to the composition of epidemic media? So this was sort of one basic argument in the book 
that I was probing a multi-scalar emergence that is the pandemic at molecular, clinical, and planetary scales. And I began to understand the shortcomings of thinking of only one of these. A narrow focus on clinical medical solutions alone obscures the environmental disrepair at the heart of pathogenic emergence. For acute infectious disease emergences are not actually just medical emergencies to be fought with expensive medical solutions, vaccines, and therapies, life-saving as they are. And I'm no anti-vaxxer. We totally need these. We know that 60.3 of viral emergences in the last four decades are cross-species spillovers. And more than 71% of these arise at the interface with wildlife, those feral ecologies, as some call them, but with known anthropogenic drivers as pathogenicity, like deforestation, wildlife trading, industrial agriculture. We've heard lots about this. Equally, this one health paradigm that asks us to think about animal health, human health, and biodiversity, when thought at a planetary scale, this can sometimes foreclose discussions of differential experiences across the world during pande pandemic emergencies. As we know from indigenous studies scholars like Michelle Murphy and Beth Pavanelli, for many communities, the, this biospheric catastrophe that we have um, has been ongoing for a while in the colonial sphere for centuries. Pandemics in this regard are x-rays of a general condition, even as they do exacerbate, as we saw everywhere, existing inequities of not only long-term health healthcare access, but also housing, food security, and employment. So my chapter, uh, the one that I'm going to draw on today is the one on the blood, blood files, which unpacks these differentials by starting at the blood processing lab that you saw in the global north, but proceeding then to these points of care, these medical clinics in the global south in Mumbai and Cape Town. And these were the two that I was discussing. The blood file as a media form gestures towards a sprawling a global biomedical infrastructure whose operations rely as much on high-tech affordances and expertise as it does on localized acts of translational practice and care. The blood files ultimately indexed managed HIV as an ongoing challenge, a massive distributed creative experiment rather than an inevitable effect of scientific discovery. I want to stay with this global dimension of the book, but let me just finish up on the virus touch briefly the structure. It has three main chapters, as you see, uh, that is chapters two, three, four. Um, these are media chapters on uh, knowledge practices of the HIV AIDS uh, uh, era. Um, and this is about the virus as a pathogenic object, the blood tests, the milieu for transmission, and animal hosts of zoonotic spillovers. And so this is about the ecology of infection. But you'll notice that the three chapters are framed by chapter one, which is the historical chapter, why the knowledge practices of the HIV, uh, HIV AIDS era is actually really crucial to thinking about uh, our pandemic uh, today. And this is what I call the epidemic episteme, which begins in the early 80s. The HIV AIDS epidemic had taught us hard lessons that we can't eradicate some viruses, but we must learn to live with them, perhaps artfully, technologically, as Donna Haraway once put it. If the HIV AIDS pandemic has taught us the arts of living with loss, what might this mean for the COVID experience? So today I'll really go into a chapter of the next book, uh, which is on what I call the air breath complex. Now the COVID pandemic, has forced us to see air, right, as an all too transitive medium for the transport of SARS-CoV-2. Viruses, as we know, lack locomotion. We know from epidemiological studies, viruses rely for their movement on air, water, or soil for transport, hitching a ride on life-sustaining environments for human and microbial life. This is why the air between us has suddenly appeared as a dangerous elemental medium, as does the breath of the other, even at six feet distances. Tied as it is to its site of original production, much like blood, feces, or saliva, breath is a vital medium that becomes transitive as vaporized exhalation. So it's both elemental and vital. 
One iterative realization during acute infectious disease epidemics is that vital media habitually breach the boundaries between individuals, between populations, and between species. Just think of the continuing blood donation controversies of the HIV AIDS era. So the air breadth complex, as I call it now, underscores the continuities of a planetary medium that we think of as air with a vital one, breath. We perceive a double movement, intensive into the lungs and extensive in the air between us. And this is something that I also learned from Pater's work. Only think of how air became visible during the airborne pandemic. An indirect and paradoxical effect of the lockdowns across the world was the sudden emergence of clean air. And this is, of course, uh, India Gate. As we watch the temporal dissolves like this from industrial air, heavy with particles, to a clearing atmosphere on CNN World News, we apprehended the air precisely when it disappeared visually. This circulated image uh, situates the planet's atmosphere in the recognizable environs of New Delhi, and this is the place I'll talk about more. Encoding the elemental medium, the temporal notation made air legible as a shared extensive environment between us, while the location of the image in a series of images like this made this elemental condition of clean air globally synchronous. Organized around iconic images as the Eiffel Tower, there was the Venice Canals, there was Rio's Christ the Redeemer. Um, these images instituted geographic distance. Air was both planetary and global. The dissolve reminded us of a planetary disrepair, the frag frag fragility of breathable air, always under threat from what Arundhati Roy has named the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. As well as the locations of these elemental conditions unevenly emergent in the world of human affairs, the globe, right? So the different AQI indexes, for instance. And beyond the frame, breath lingers here, present as a feeling of constricting lungs that we were once familiar with from the polluted air sensorium and now newly resonant in a pandemic that has taught us the experience of running out of breath. The imminent disappearance of breath stalks this dissolve as a possibility. Conversely, on the other side, there's a cluster of serial photographs. I won't spend too much time on this. Just show you a few, which are what I call mask visualities of COVID-19 that located all the masking practices all over the world in particular places, but mostly in cities with certain amount of population densities, uh, featuring them on billboards, on urban graffiti, graffiti and posters. This Think Global Health's Art of the Pandemic feature that was published in 2021 puts the global synchrony of COVID pandemic fully on display once more with racially coded bodies and linguistic signage introducing disjuncture and difference into global habit. These photographic media forms make legible what mass technologies try to contain and regulate, embodied breath that had become potentially pathogenic. Breath becoming air is conjured as a sensible patina intuitively grasped or apprehended uh, from the partial knowledge as viewers in photographs like this try to see and measure distances between objects arranged within the frame. So, you know, you see the children without masks running in bef before a graffiti on masks. Now, it may be apparent to you that I'm working with pandemic experientialities that exceed direct sense data, that is the visual sense in these compositions of air and breath. Photographs and moving images such as these were dime a dozen during COVID, encoding life-sustaining elemental and vital media by different kinds of cultural reference. But air and breath also has a concrete materiality beyond the semiotic frame, as film theorist Vivian Sobchak once taught us, one that is embedded in the historical awareness of the pandemic. This is the promise of the media form, as Lyon Larkin explains it, because the media form gestures towards the very conditions of ex existence for an object to become an object in the first place. His example, I'll, I'll explain that a little later. His example is an electricity box that encodes infrastructure, at once the technological ensembles 
and the site of reciprocal exchange between humans and machines. Ordinary infrastructure like electricity comes into view and formed in this box. In this regard, the electricity box is a media form that constitutes our relation to an otherwise invisible technological ensemble that conditions modern industrial existence. So we notice in electricity when we don't have it or the lights go out. Most importantly, though, media are representational like this, but they are also uh, sensorial and affective. Even as they compose matter, their material configurations retain a concrete thingness. Here, Larkin is obviously following Jacques Rassier's insistence on the properness of the political aesthetic form. Highly valued aesthetic representations make things legible precisely by weeding out unnecessary clutter from proper compositions. A theorist of the improper as an incitement to politics, Rassier draws attention to what is partitioned away, what is intuited, we only have partial knowledge of it, what is felt, and what is anticipated. In other words, what is apprehensible. With this reading of the media form in mind, I'll focus mainly on one cluster of photographs that are contiguous with the uh, with the globally synchronous visualizations of air and breath, but which are very particular to what I'll talk about, India's second wave pandemic experience. These are photographs, crematoria photographs, featuring smoke rising from funeral pyres. And this is Danish Siddiqui's very famous drone footage of the Simapuri crematorium. And you see uh, what he photographs is actually uh, this extension um, uh, lot in which the trees are cut so that in April 2021, it becomes, it's a makeshift crematorium. And this has a certain kind of credibility because at the time, the Narendra Modi government was saying there was no crisis at hand, but we were seeing mass uh, uh, funerals. So this is the address of this footage is dual, an existential image of death at mass scale, which is, that universalizes. But it's also a local image for Delhi residents who would immediately recognize the implications of makeshift crematoria that fueled very high demands for wood. So wood, wood prices shot up and they placed the city's trees at high risk. Local residents would further notice the searing tongues. If you see, there's a building at the back of the second photograph leaping up at the multi-storied building next to the cleared ground. And this building was already in the news as under threat. So this multimedia footage captured the loss of vegetation diagrammatically by marking a before and after to the Simapori crematorium extension. The image is thick with the loss of human life, loss of trees, loss of breathable futures. And there were many such aerial images throughout the, uh, the, uh, this second wave. As such images sped through online platforms, not only did they expose the scale of death, but they posed a terrifying possibility for all, a possibility apprehensible in the intuited stench of burning bodies. I pause on this cluster of images, hard as they are, because they persist as the after image. That is the indel indelible sensory impress that lingers long after the event, as Zahid Choudhury has argued, of traumatic images. As such, crematoria images function as a wake-up call for deadly air breath damage. So in circulating these photographs is a kind of COVID wake, which will no doubt be protracted and painful in decades to come. My reflections here are preliminary, but they're drawing inspiration from Christina Sharp's landmark in the wake on Blacklists and Being, where she speaks to the afterlife of slavery in, con in contemporary Black experiences of punishment, regulation, incarceration, and death. Black death is normative and necessary for this so-called democracy, or the U.S., she surmises. It is the very ground we walk on. With other scholars of global racial capitalism, she underscores the persistence of global anti-Blackness as the root of premature and preventable Black death, fueled as it is with everything from long-term long healthcare inequity to extrajudicial murders. Sharp's call to a, for a wake for the uncounted informs not only my assembly of the crematoria photographs, but the attunement in this talk to racial and class differences in these photographs that index premature and preventable death. Specifically, the photographs gesture towards, but do not disclose the ca cascading COVID 
uh, infection effects and mass deaths of sanitation and crematoria workers, often low caste and class, who bore the brunt of India's second wave. I'll return to these photographs shortly, but my point here is simple. The smoke signals from the cremate crematoria are as much about environmental pollution and mass death as they are about workers caught in the smoke densities, vulnerable without PPE sometimes, open to manifold hazards, who stood witness to collective loss. So there are many pictures of these which are sort of crematoria tableaus. And this is, of course, a larger global phenomenon in a recent issue of Kalfu, who are Costa Vargas and Matthew Flynn, among others, have analyzed uh, this uh, the COVID pa uh, pandemic social triage. Uh, so its distribution of death within so-called democracies, certain social conjuries suffering from long histories of biopolitical neglect are already more vulnerable to viral emergence than others. In the same way, decolonial critics have tracked the necropolitical impacts of racial, racial and class inequities that shapes and divines the biological existence of historically dispossessed communities. These conversations frame my claims of preventable and premature death, invoking a swath of reports on differentials in COVID deaths that were not just about mismanagement and the mismanagement of, say, Trump's America or higher Bolsonaro's Brazil or Narendra Modi's India, which were very similar. During India's second wave, no one from any class or caste stratum seemed to escape the clutches of virulence, and that's why there's a ferocious cry, right? The middle and upper classes were also dying without hospitals because New Delhi's biggest private hospitals ran out of oxygen in April 2021, and similar tragedies were unfolding in Mumbai, Amritsar, Gurgaon, Kunul, Moradabad, Jammu, Goa, a few uh, local disaster sites. Predictably, however, the place that I want to stay is how these were exponentially higher for the most dispossessed. To approach pandemic archives this way is to introduce differentials that articulate more than national specificities. It is certainly the case that this was a period that saw the forming up of sovereign nation state borders that governed resource distribution, health policy, infrastructural management. And so in this national picture, India's like one seventh, right, of in global COVID debt burden. There have been volumes written on this. Some blamed the disaster on the sudden emergence of a deadly contagious mutation, the Delta uh, uh, variant, in a rather naturalizing move. They argued that it was the sheer scale and density of India's population that had turned a raging infection into a deadly massacre. Yet the performance of photojournalism, like Siddiqui's photographs, militates against the Modi regime's utter silence about the scale of death and infrastructure failure. The Modi government literally went missing for three weeks with government representatives protesting there was no insufficiency in the national medical oxygen supply. And I uh, apologize for showing these images, but actually they were circulating quite widely on WhatsApp. Close allies of the Prime Minister, such as the Thanato political Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adyanath, ordered property seizures of those who spread rumors on WhatsApp about the lack of oxygen supply. While there was no accurate data on the number of deaths during April and May 2021, a news report from the Health and Metrics Evaluation uh, Committee estimated the number of COVID-related deaths during April, May 2021 to be 650,000, thrice the official number, and projected crossing 1 million by September 2021. And then there's a whole lot of non-governmental uh, agencies and hospital data that actually put it at 2 million died in this episode. Pandemic differentials also emerge as spatially localized uh, effects because of a disrupted connectivity, everything from transportation to global supply chains. Formally or informally con constituted local communities made do with what they had, where they were, as the tragedy materialized differentially across the nation. And interestingly, it was the capital Delhi had some of the worst uh, episodes because there was no direct uh, pipeline supply to hospitals. And this places this whole episode in the global south, of course. 
And most of the medical oxygen, uh, oxygen generating plants were located in the eastern parts and had to be driven over. So again and again, you saw images like this oxygen coming from elsewhere. The government said, you know, we the usual um, uh, demand is 3842 metric tons a day. But by April, it had become 11,000 metric tons a day. So how could we meet this? And then there were questions of trucks being stopped. There were insufficient chirogenic tankers, so on and so forth, right? So there's a logistical failure happening. But a deeper read of this locates the problem in their selective approach to health expertise and their political commitment to private enterprise as a source of public goods. This is a very long argument, but the government spends less than 3% GDP on health. And they were told in October 2020 that there was not sufficient oxygen. And I'm thinking of this actually in your series as a kind of a vital commons. And they kind of ignored the predictions and estimates. Uh, there were a few tenders floated for 162 plants. Um, and But by the time April came around and the, actually the disaster hit, there wasn't enough oxygen. Um, so under these circumstances, a brisk black market emerged around the medical oxygen cylinder as the most wanted industrial commodity. And so you have these smaller oxygens, that the, the ones that the mountaineers use. Uh, they were selling at about $300, a huge amount for in rupees, uh, while the actual cost was actually $1,000. Um, uh, um, uh, sorry, was actually $12. Those who could afford it bought oxygen concentrators which were, it's around $480, but it was being sold for $1,200, right? So this created a yawning social chasm and encoding modern industrial solutions to this natural disaster because, of course, uh, the concentrated oxygen um, uh, 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 filtered 20% of oxygen from, um, sorry, the cylinder promised much more than what the lungs can, right? Because it filters, lungs only filter 21% of oxygen from the air. So this medical oxygen now acquired the luster of the prized techno fix. But the value was economic because of scarcities and the problem of circulation. It had become by now a dominant icon of uh, uh, the second wave. Um, Photographs of cylinders stacked in storage rooms, rusty but ready, rubbed shoulders with their deployment in makeshift breathing outfits at gudwaras or auto rickshaws. A litany of media uh, forms captured uh, cylinders in transit and all modes of uh, transport, cars, taxis, bodies rolled on carts. Like Brian Larkin's electrical box, as you remember, the cylinder drew attention to a hitherto invisible technological ensemble that we call infrastructure and the logistics of delivery. Suddenly necessary as a lung, the cylinder became the basis of a national respiratory politics. Why weren't those uh, oxygen generating plants ready? Why did the government mismanage the medical uh, oxygen distribution? Why was medical uh, uh, oxygen, and this was the greater question, not a vital commons that, in Lauren Berland's terms, holds and organizes common life? Since the cylinder could not be disentangled from the lung, it induced sensory apprehensions of the very conditions for our life, the prana and pneuma of ancient yore. In all these ways, the images of the medical oxygen cylinder became COVID's industrial prosthesis, complementing the existential force of the crematoria images. So let me return and close with this. The specific resonances here that circulated in a huge number of photojournalistic images. One strand is what I'm calling these crematoria tableau, in which you have hazmat suited fig figures barely visible tending to priors. This spectral hazmat clad figure watches over expiration, a photograph ironically captioned smoke clearing from the crematorium. Taken by another prize winning photographer, Adnan Abidi, the photograph is impressionistic, highlighting the stark loneliness accompanying mass death, even as the smoky thickness reminds us of those who died without oxygen. It marks a genre that made the synesthetic crackle of fire, the stench of death, the confusing visibility palpable, foregrowing comprehension for affective force. Intensifying perceptions of air breath, 
such as uh, in such photographs induced grief and despair in those marked by loss. And many, I mean, Indians abroad and at home, very, very few were not touched by this. So to return to my methodological premise in the virus touch, one might ask what these epidemic media do. On the one hand, the smoke signals, as I'm calling them, stitch India's second wave into the fabric of global tra tragedies. Smoke haze is a go global cultural grammar in myriad aesthetic comp compositions of the air breath complex. Like the Charles Purse's index, and his index's example is the bullet hole, for example, smoke densities from the pious gesture towards an actual event, COVID deaths at mass scale. The index acquires an affective intensity from experiences of loss and a symbolic heft in the face of official repression. On the other hand, and the more importantly, the makeshift crematoria are indices of specific death rituals and specific notations of grievous bodily harm from smoke inhalation. It is true that the photographer documentarian bears some part of that harm in running the risk of exposure, right? So this is the conditions of existence for media, right? But it is not comparable in kind from the long exposure to infection and hazardous smoke inhalation. With some crematoria recording as many as 30 to 40 priors an hour at the height of the second wave, one can imagine the extreme precarity of the masked figures in hazmat suits that aesthetically dominate these apocalyptic scenes. Who might they be? What are their circumstances? How long do they tend to the fires? Speculating from partial knowledge, and I can talk about the lack of statistics, deliberate lack of statistics that uh, here, one turns to the long histories of disposition. For centuries, Dalit laborers have been assigned the arduous work of burning bodies. The smoke signals point to caste class differences that define normally precarious circumstance, bodily injury from risk of infection and smoke inhalation become exponentially more dangerous at the peak of an acute airborne infectious disease emergence. In the absence of sustained data, there is sparse, in, uh, sparse investigation into the implications of the epidemic for Dalit and Adivasi or indigenous communities who remain at the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. So there was a lot of analysis about, you know, where, uh, in what villages Dalits lived, but also the, the, the lessening chances of receiving care when it was scarce, a black market prices, a problem of access. Um, in Bangalore, there was some data and a lot of NGOs collected data. But to all of this lack of healthcare, one might ask, one might add sanitation labor, cleaners, manual sca scavengers and waste pickers and crematorium work as compounding the pandemic precarities for those at the lowest caste class rungs. In this intensification of precarity, we see a normative necropolitics become virulent. This is why black death as an ontological condition is a generative analytic. The starting point for examining the distributions of premature and preventable death during COVID, some arising from active decisions to let die, built on extant historical differences, racial, ethnic, religious, sexual, and otherwise. And I've written a long paper on sort of population culling during COVID. And so awake begins on many fronts. In this talk, a speculative history cobbled from the scattered data from nonprofits and grassroots organizations, helpline accounts, and these visual media archives. Quilting all others, partly because of their apocalyptic character, the crematoria images place us at the threshold of annihilation, at the extinction of air breath. The media form induces sensory apprehensions of the conditions of existence for the photograph. Who tick took it? Under what conditions? Who lives among the fires that burned for months? Who survived? Probing the proper composition, we edge towards a situated respiratory politics attuned to the ongoing dispossessions of the colonial sphere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I um, I have a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts and feelings, as my students might say, about what you just shared. Um, 
I, I was thinking, um, of course, a very different context, but also perhaps connected to this, um, this uh, project and the indexical relationship of those images to the Canadian fires that we experienced um, in the Northeast US. And of course the fires that are characterizing now um, sort of the summers, the California summers, the Northern California summers, um, that that element uh, could could play a role in this in this emerging project. So I wanted to throw it out there because as I watched the, the images mm -hmm. that you were displaying, I couldn't help but think of, of, of actually trying to make this sense of this to my children to the point where, because we could smell the smoke, right? And they kept saying that they, mm. they kept associate Canada with smoke. So we we traveled to Montreal. They kept saying, but we're not gonna go to the to the place where they're burning trees, are we? And we're like, no, but mm. there was a, a, a funny kind of mnemonic thing that they developed around the the smell of smoke, the visual um uh, sort of apprehension of 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 smoke in the air and um and Canada. So just throwing it out there as a as something that that, that that might be useful to you at some point down the line. Um one thing I wanted to ask you um as a way of um of perhaps starting this um back and forth is um a little bit about your journey to write uh the virus touch and now write uh this new uh this new project. Because it seems like, um, you know, from what I read in the book and, of course, the, our, our prefatory conversation, you've been working about, uh, you've been working on this project for quite a while, yet so much of it, um, the the virus touch itself sort of unfolds in the kind of horrific uh, sort of um, conjuncture of 2020. So it's it's very interesting how the book, the, the yeah. life... Um, the lifespan of the book exceeds the very uh, centrality of COVID, if you will, to its its own um, uh, chronological sort of emergence. So I was curious about how you um, how you situate this project in your own in your own path. Uh, you know, apart from the obvious sort of challenges of doing administrative work while also trying to be an intellectual. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you for th for that question. And I'll just say, actually, uh, regarding uh, your kids asking about smoke, you know, one of the things that um, really inspired me, and it's interesting, I've come back to smoke, um, um, it was Isabel Stenger's work. You know, she, she has a great essay called Ontological Politics, in which she says, you know, the smoke has been in our nostrils for a while. And so, you know, we actually have these apprehensions of all kinds of things that we don't really think about clearly until, you know, you have television footage about fires in Canada. You know, that's a cancer object and its composition. And suddenly, oh, it's in Canada, but no, actually it's on the planet, you know. So that's the kind of the apprehensible, larger milieu that the aesthetic always tries to manage, but also opens us to. You know, good all good aesthetics open us to things. So I think uh, I think your uh, your children are probably trying that aesthetic composure and learning about how actually it is also about other times. And now she calls it interestingly, Carlos. She called it a mnemonic. Uh, she she says it's time for a new memory. And you know, in some ways, the book Virus Touch is about a new memory for epidemics, and that's why I think. HIV AIDS, but also Marburg, Hunter, you know, those viruses of the early 80s are so important for us to go back to. You know, it's time for it. We've known all this stuff. And, you know, when the vaccine capitalism stuff happened in COVID and there was hoarding and I thought, did we learn nothing from HIV AIDS? You know, and the, all the activism around the drugs and generic. So, you know, there, there is a way in which we don't remember. So though you could say the entire book is a mnemonic of sorts, but that sort of goes to your, to the question of how I came to this. You know, I was very, uh, I was really looking at risk media and, you know, in the risk discourse, it's always about, uh, you feel risk because you think the experts are lying to you. They're not telling you something, right? It's, a, it's in that gap of trust. And so I began to look at, you know, expertise itself, because I was being told HIV is manageable now. 
It's a chronic condition lived in a doctor's office. And for me, it never was, you know, for many of us, it never was, right? That. So um, I began to look at that rub and then I really fell into, you asked about why that long. I kind I had to take a couple of courses in biology, one on virology. I mean, you know, these were courses I was taking on and off because I thought that I can't not learn the science, you know, and learn it with intention and learn it the best I could without being trained in it um, and say something about it like, oh, the scientists are doing this and then it's not good enough. So I actually fell into an STS project. Very interestingly, I've come back up to where I began, which is about these grassroots communities and global inequities. Because for me, that sort of planetary molecular scale was fascinating and important but it left out these differences that, you know, most of my work has always addressed. So I think in this book, um, this new book, I don't even know if it's a book. <laughs> you know, I'm always ha wanting to write public books and ending up writing academic ones. But it's about, it's called Epidemic Intensities. And I'm interested in intensity because, you know, the intensity is always a variable, right? Something is more intense than something else. And so I want to get at epidemic intensities as differential experiences all over the world during COVID using the science studies stuff that comes out of the virus. Study. So that's, that's sort of the short answer. I have to give my uh, editor, Courtney Berger at Duke, uh, I really did push me. I kept saying, I can't finish this book. It's, we're in the middle of another pandemic. I'm not writing about COVID. And she said, finish it. So Pato, you will appreciate this, how when COVID broke out, some of us who had been working with this stuff, suddenly HIV was historical. And to find that your life has become historical in part, is it's disconcerting. So I turned that experience into a mnemonic, a memory device. One, one interesting, um, and thank you for kind of giving us a, a sense of the back, um, the background work that you did and the, the kind of skills building that you did to engage the science. Because again, as I as I shared with you um, earlier when we were preparing, I, I really thought of your book in relationship to the history of uh, cultural critique in the AIDS crisis. Um, you know, I'm thinking Cindy Patton, I'm thinking Paula Treichler, um, Doug Krim, and um, I think her name is Walby, uh, Catherine Walby, perhaps? Yes. Yes. Um, the folks who decided that um, the the fighting AIDS was not just about um, kind of engaging the scientists, but that that the life of AIDS as a as a cultural phenomenon was important to the point where we needed to engage in a kind of um, uh, critical process of engaging that as a as a separate as related yet separate set of processes. One of the things I see in your work, particularly in the virus touch, is that you are really inviting us to see the mutual, uh, mutually constitutive nature of the biological in the representational politics. And I, and I see um, that very much playing into how this text is very distinctive from that earlier work because of, not just because of the level of involvement and engagement with science, but because of your um, sort of refusal to, um, to sort of say, well, this is cultural, this is biological, this is this, this is that. And in fact, even the way you define media um, and um, for purposes of your book is already fudging those boundaries. So I was curious about your interaction with that earlier work and how you, how you see uh, the 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 work that you are doing and and perhaps other scholars in in this area um, sort of uh, guiding us um, on the you know on the foundations that that were set by by some of these folks who were not just academics but many of them were very they were culture warriors of the of the epidemic. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, I actually reread Cindy Patton's Inventing AIDS again and again and again because you know the point that science was cult a cultural enterprise. 
you know, that uh, what did it mean to talk about a host and a pathogen? That itself, as we know, is a discursive construction, right? Some people will say you can't even separate the species. We are multi species, you know, so one could go on. But this notion of science as a cultural performance for me was very reassuring in those early days when we were losing friends and community, right? So, um, I, and we began to, what is science doing? And what is it telling us? And of course, so many, particularly ACT UP, and there's been you know so much written about that, um, is that um, they, the people learning science and saying that here, look, it's not, we, we can also make something else happen. And I think Melinda Cooper and Waldby have been important because they talk about this, you know, the zero phase trial, you know, people who were already taking other medicines and let's put them in the trials, you know, all of this stuff. So the, it was also a moment of collaboration, you know, between scientists who were well-intentioned and activists. So there was that was an inspiring moment. And I think actually... In the COVID, uh, the uh, labs that I uh, went, uh, the the blood processing lab, um, uh, the they started in 1985, right, with early HIV/AIDS infection, right. So these were people who've been in this battle for a very long time, right. So I wanted to also do the West Coast because you know it's Seattle and it's uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego because so much has been written about New York. Right. And so I wanted to bring up partly and that's kind of buried in the book, but that that's partly one of the histories with these people who've been. So you're right. There are there are scientific cultural warriors to which there is a great depth, a debt. And I end the book with Paula Trickler, you know, how to, you know, how to write theory in an epidemic. And now I'm like, how to write media theory in an epidemic. Right. Um, so. Uh, to your question about media, I think I've been very inspired by people who are working on chemical politics. Like, you know, when you pop a smart pill, all these smart drugs, um, it's, it's, it is a pill that does things to your body biologically and chemically. But it's also you're popping it thinking because it's a smart pill. You can't actually dissociate the sign from the actual thing right? Nor is it just popping a pill will change you, right? Chemically. So, so I don't, I can't separate the two. You know, the oxygen cylinder image, images that were uh, circulated on WhatsApp, they were circulated in WhatsApp so pe because people were looking for it. So the, the image and the circulation were both, the, it's one and the same, right? So I don't, I think that's a productive way, productive thing that new, new materialism has given us is to think of not separating those two, you know, the, the semiotic and uh, the physical. Yeah. I, I don't know if that answers your question, Carlos, but that's where I would go. Yeah. That's terrific. Well, Paco, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I think you answered it beautifully. And I think the book does it quite beautifully, which makes me eager for, for the coming book of Epidemic Intensities. I want to try to hold what we've been discussing so far and maybe do a couple of maneuvers. Um, you spoke, you know, about Stanger and that the smoke's been in our nostrils, right? And, you know, several, I'm, so I'm living with long COVID. I, I got sick quite early in the pandemic. Um, and several long COVID siblings, as we might call ourselves, have been talking about different hacks, mouthwashes and nasal sprays before or after, you know, going to the grocery store or a flight or something. And the latest one I just got this week from somebody was a tip from a nurse they received about Neosporin in the nostrils as a way to kind of protect the linings against invasion. And I think you you talk a lot about the relational and the porosity in the book beautifully. This at so many levels, as Carlos and you just said, like this refusal to to let the binary abide by the binary, as it were. But nonetheless, these hacks, right? And so I'm thinking about nostrils, I'm thinking about smoke, as you said, Carlos and fire, and and thinking about um, this idea of new memories, Vishnu, and, and the mnemonic, this idea of a memory device. Um, you know, the science is moving in a lot of directions trying to understand COVID, but how much what many of us long haulers are experiencing as a persistence of the virus, like presence of the virus ongoing, and or the body, the cellular memory of its presence and the cells activating to have fought this thing, this invader back then, 
as compared to an ongoing at a minimum dialectic, but very fluid process. And so one of the things I, I suppose we could call it a mnemonic that some of us do is is mark our illiversaries. So I thought I would just read very briefly from this because it seems to hold this breath fire um, that we've been talking about. So on March 2nd of this year, I wrote, today is my anniversary. I stumble into year four of living with the virus's reservoirs of resolve. COVID's toll on the body and spirit. A sore throat was my first warning sign on March 2nd, 2020. A symptom so subtle yet common that the emerging medical guidance assured it was no sign at all. They didn't know that I'd already inhaled a floating ember of the wildfire infection. Tissue as tinder, the issue is tender, swiped out. Four days ago, a raging soreness once again enveloped my throat. It seemed to come out of nowhere, except chronic illness is everywhere, in the body, our collective body, this fragile, magnificent body, that opens with a throat. Sick, scratch, scrape, shout, sore, sour. I've been stubbornly insisting on a long hauling existence that is far more than just dour. And I'll pause there because I, I just wanna bring that right back to what we were talking about. But I too, Carlos, have been thinking a lot about fire, indigenous practices of tending to land um, and trying to now hold that in, in relationship to these memories of this quilting, as you said, Bishnu, of the crematoria, uh, how that spectacle as it existed in global media circulating bumps up against what it was meaning in the day-to-day -day, right up into the workers who were tending those fires and caring for the dead, I would say caring. Um, so I want to highlight a couple of things and then come into my question for you, Bishnu. One is the gap of trust. That is such a powerful thing that you said, the gap of trust. And early on, I dropped it in the chat, but uh, a series of folks who were getting and in, in, who got infected and then were not, quote, getting well, wanted to try to understand these new symptoms that we, we now understand as under the umbrella of long COVID. That group is called patient research, um, patient led research. So it's using the language of patient. And some of those patients were doctors and or scientists, some were organizers, some were data visualists. But a really, I think, moving grassroots um, effort that is ongoing now, we're almost at year four, that reminds me a little bit of where the two of you just went, what you called the cultural warriors, Carlos, and um, what I think you do so beautifully throughout the book, Bishnu, uh, not abiding by um, the techno-optimism that you use the cylinder in today's talk as a reminder of that, but but also not um, allowing these kind of separations that happen all the way to this day in the academy of there are the sciences, here are the social sciences, softer, here are the humanities. And I guess there's this thing called art and poetry and film over here, right? Like I really love to Carlos's early question about your journey, what you bring with your literary analysis brilliance and all of your kind of post-colonial rigor meeting um, questions of indigeneity, questions of media studies, questions of ecological studies. Um, it makes me very eager for book number two. And so this is how I want to then pivot back to today. Book two, epidemic intensities, you remind us that those are variable, right? Always these intensities. And I think the, the virus touch reminds us that they're relational and that the relational is the variable, including living with the virus. Um, I often say that I, 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 I seldom say my body anymore. I say this body or our body referring to COVID and its after effects. So I want to bring all that to bear, thinking of intensities, the new book, what you share today with so much of the work you're doing in the in this book, with the touch in the virus touch. I love that you close the um, the intro. I have to try to find it because it's so beautiful how you do this. You know, you scaffold all these amazing ideas and then you can so succinctly distill and you close the intro by saying along these stretches the contours that you outline intensely we feel the virus touch such a beautiful sentence and so there was the intensity that you're going to pick up in the next book there's the feeling that you're reminding us all the somatics along with our science and yet you keep coming back to touch and I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit because I think it's both deeply poetic and haptic and vital. Um, and of course, the title of the book would imply that it's the virus's touch, but there's all these other touches too. So that's my my question for you. 
Well, I'd forgotten the line and thank you. That's a beautiful question. Um, but let me, you know, I remember, where were we, Pato, where you did that uh, exhibit with the spoons? Yeah, we were at um, Pitzer College and that was an Pitzer. exhibit we did called Lingering, which is another concept that is pulsing throughout your work, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, that Lingering series, um, uh, it was interesting when you were talking about, you know, going to the hospital again and again and, you know, those narratives that you were proposing. And I I uh, have now, um, I had talked a little bit about media and risk, but I wanted to bring this up because one of the things that I've learned, at least, both from activist communities and writing the book, is what is epidemic intelligence? You know, there is CDC's disease detective Alexander Langmore in the 50s, you know, has this huge project. But I've come to think about epidemic intelligence a little bit differently. You know, that what is it? Popular epidemiology, right? Lots of communities seeing something happening before the doctors find out. You, people know you have long COVID. My doctor finally, in the last visit, said, yeah, we are seeing some people who have very long symptoms. I'm like, <laughs> I've been telling you about friends for a whole, you know, one and a half years. So, so you know, the medical community with all the verification they have to do, and I'm not putting it down, I'm just saying that it's almost late to the table always, right? And so I've edited this um, select, uh, the series of essays by, uh, called First Looks, and this is on positions, you know, it's an online thing. And what was interesting about it, it's all on frontline, uh, um, uh, frontline healthcare workers observations. And it was inspired by something Cind Cindy Patton told me. She said, go look at uh, this archive that uh, CDC has about called In Their Own Words. It's nurses who first saw HIV uh, patients come in and they didn't know what they were seeing, you know, but they recorded it. And everything they recorded, and there's one nurse who actually keeps certain samples. She begins to hoard, uh, you know, wet evidence, right? That becomes the basis of science. So if you didn't actually recognize something, tabulate it, classify it, identify it, store it, and think this is actually important for future generations, if that intelligence wasn't there, you wouldn't have scientific discovery. Right. So I've been actually thinking about what does it mean to have this kind of experiential intelligence that you're, I think, a lot of your work, a lot of people like the site you you just read, I'm going to look at. I think of this as epidemic intelligence and not in the terms of military intelligence, but a kind of a rare kind of intelligence work that we all all do. So I think your first, your big, I'm very interested in that. I don't know where I've written a couple of essays about nurses during 1918, right? Uh, so th that kind of frontline intelligence. <laughs> is what I'm calling it, which which goes back to Carlos's question about this kind of the cultural. And as a literature person, I know how to read the narrative. You know, I know how that it assembles fact, right? Yes. And and what's assembled in inside it between the lines and what's not said. I think that you exactly. do that so beautifully in this, the, the virus touch, um, while also having, as you said, had to go to class for learning the science, right? And so you yeah. take us on a journey in that book, um, and and I really appreciate this moment. I, I think it's one of the great gifts that HIV and feminist health have given us over the last 40 or 50 years. I should say not HIV, but the way people have responded, that activist organizing and forms of mutual aid and care, I think are uh, you're honoring and embodying and moving forward those prax practices in this book is, is really quite clear to me. And I brought up patient-led research, not to overly reground us in, in this temporal frame of COVID as much as it matters to me and as much as we're all in it, but because I see them very much working in the lineage of people who would produce mimeograph photocopied newsletters, right? With updated information as AZT came onto the scene, right? And what it meant to kind of distribute and do care precisely because doctors and certainly scientific research um, let alone scaled up trials, are operate at a different time scale. I'm being generous, but there's a different time scale. And patient-led research said, what's the knowledge of the body and not just individual? Yes. 
I yeah. haven't read an anniversary later, that anniversary gets precisely back out to the collective. But I think your work reminds us of the importance of the that relational to the knowledge we co our collective body bodies that we then mm -hmm. um, honor reflexively and critically to then tap the knowledge that we're we're experiencing in real time. Um, and the importance then of also bringing a process like verification, right? Or not collapsing all scales into each other so that your work that you share today or Carlos's children's curiosity slash trepidation of going to Montreal, like remind us of the scales of these connectedness, even as in today's talk, I really appreciated that you held that, let's call it the global, the transnational, and then never lost the particular, the particular place, the particular cultural tradition, the particular of labor practices, um, the particularities yeah. of government silences. And so I, I guess I want to just keep holding this thing you're leaving me thinking about today that gap of trust right why the gap who, to, who do we trust including our own sick bodies um and then back out to to the kinds of touches and i guess i'm speaking here about affect right and care and that tonality um that um yeah that i appreciate in inside of your work um sorry. i i forgot to answer to your question about touch i was getting there but i um no I, no i i kind of i appreciate you bringing it uh back to the question of touch i was a little worried about it first i have to say because it has a kind of a uh it can have a theological sort of you know frame as well Right. And I was like, mm, I should I really want to do this. And, you know, but but the touch um, is, I think for me, it, it's interesting. I'd been working on speculation for a while. And, you know, speculation has Latin roots. It also has because it's Indo-European languages. It's, it's from Sanskrit as well. It also means sparsh. Sparsh is touch. You know, and so I was very interested in sort of speculative knowledge making. Uh, that that happens and uh, you know so that was one of the things that always and it comes from a very uh, very very I think deep-rooted sense of um, uh, you could say even anger against I grew up with a fair amount of privilege in a very poor city Calcutta and I worked in my early years very formative years when I was like 11 and 12 and 13 I'd worked with Mother Teresa in her home for the dying and it was very much what my family said, oh, don't touch those people. You know, don't, don't touch. There's a kind of a pathological, and it was about class. It was about disease. It was about death. It was about being too young to face the death, you know, all of those things. So that those were my first images of really being close to someone dying and having any kind of human reach being pathologized. And then again and again and again, of course, then HIV AIDS came along. I mean, you know, I don't even have to make, make this argument, right? So touch for me was something that was forbidden, right? Um, pathologized uh, and something about care and something about affect, right? And about contagion. So it it because it had such thickness in my own history, in many ways, uh, I know, Carlos, it is, became an academic book, but it's also a very personal one. You know, yeah. It, it, it feels extremely personal, though. And one thing that I um, that I wanted to point out is that um, that you that the the there was a the way you you set up the pro the um, the project of knowledge of your of your work right, um, even in this discussion, is um, I think it's remarkable to me that oftentimes in this book, there are moments when I'm not really sure, I'm, I'm not really sure, and I think you dwell in a sense of uncertainty that has to do with precisely the ethos of those communities of care where we notice stuff, we don't know what it is, but we know we're noticing it and we take it down because somebody else is going to come in and see it and say, oh, this is what it was. But you need to note it, right, in order for it to enter the record somehow. Because if you don't do that, if we don't perform that labor, which has to do with building archives, with making sure that our lives are saved, not just saved as in, as in keep us from dying, but 
as a species to be preserved, right? Um, that there is um, there is something there that is so deeply analogous to why uh, you know a physicist or a mathem mathematician will say, well, I'm going to work on this problem. I don't know what the problem is going to solve for anyone, but it I I have to solve it for its own sake because somebody's going to find the utility, be able to move with it, to be able to do something with it. So I found that really um, moving in terms of your reflections. And I see that very much reflected in, in the book. There's something else that I, I thought a lot about when you talked about uh, breath and um, as I recall the experience of the fires, but I also, I'm also thinking about hurricane season um, and how much, and, and even the way we inhabited the world while COVID was, uh, raging, right? And nobody knew what it was and all this other stuff. That suddenly we we humans, if you will, were uh, beginning to deal with um, tracking phenomena that we did not know, but that were touching us, irrespective of that there was that 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 dread of the touch of this thing, whatever this was, which is, you know, typical of that, the, the plague literature, Camus and, and, and some of that, like there's that the foe and oh, there's that dread of, of, of this sort of engulfing you, um, the, this, 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 this being or, or whatever. And, you know, as a, as someone who was raised in the Caribbean, I grew up with fear of hurricanes. And now, now I, I watch, you know, when hurricane season is raging, I'm always watching. <laughs> it's like the latest hurricane is coming. Where, where is it going? Where is it? So, uh, so that um, it, it, part of what I what I feel your work really uh, moves towards is thinking beyond these. Um, it, it it really is about that 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 struggle to represent that which is both ineffable and inevitable. That is that 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 the the you know the nineteenth century romantics would have talked about it as the sublime, but this is not the sublime of a Byron who's standing in front of a hill. This is more like the sublime of this air that's coming, and uh, you know you know you're going to be wrapped up in it, and there's going to be all this guidance about whether you can step out of your house or not, um, and that has implications for the way we live because the mm, these phenomena are really not. They're messing up with our sense of geography, with our sense of belonging, with our sense of everything, as you know, as scientists have predicted that they would. But I was just really struck by how in 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 thinking with your book and with what you said today, that seems to be a really salient part of the kind of world that we're that we that we've entered already. You know, some of us may not have realized it until COVID hit. Right. But this is we've been dwelling in this particular space of uncertainty. Um, in as a kind of civilizational uh, conundrum for for quite a while. You muted, Bishop. Um, that is interesting because, of course, you know the place that we began the risk with risk uh, a book with was with Frank Knight, who's a Chicago school economist who theorized risk and uncertainty. And he said something like, uncertainty is the, you know, the great volatility, right? That we, is all around a hurricane is a great way of thinking about it. And he said, risk is kind of a lasso around that. Like you ras lasso it around, you predict, you estimate, you bring it into, you tame uncertainty, right? And say, here's the future harm, buy, you know, buy your insurance, buy your this, buy your that, you'll be safe, right? And so, and that's a certain form of expertise that uh, comes up in the early 20th century, right? You have the insurance firms and all that becoming uh, big. Um, so that's where it started. And so a lot of the work that we did was really about, you know, affirmatively speculating on uncertainty. You know, I think speculation has a bad thing, right? Like I often use the example to my students of, you know, the neem plant, for instance, it's uh, the, uh, people always want to patent it, right? They want to patent it as, you know, this kind of medicine or that kind of medicine. That's only one of the uses. 
The neem plant has anti-desertification qualities, right? So each thing has many potentialities. You might not even know what it is. But we try to, speculation tries to monetize one pathway. But if you think about speculation more broadly, you kind of open yourself to a lot of different kinds of potentialities, right? And I thought that approach to uncertainty and openness to it, knowing it's going to be fearful, yeah, is is one way to uh, to understand uh, epidemics uh, and, you know, um, I wouldn't say war or famine because those are more closed forms for me, but these kind of more natural forms, you know, that that is the epidemic. And I think people who are living with HIV between, say, 1981 to, to 1995 taught us a lot about living with uncertainty, you know, and how you could, you know, you're talking uh, um, uh, about putting Neosporin in the nostrils and remembering all the Chinese drugs we did. You know, I mean, people were doing everything, right, at that point of time. So there's always a way of living with uncertainty that is fearful and joyful. Um, and I think we are in, in kind of more end times now where it seems to be only fearful. But you see, see all kinds of, you know, in India during that oxygen crisis, the story I didn't tell was one of mutual aid. I mean, people, poor people just showed up for each other. I mean, what is that? I mean, I don't want to romanticize it, right? But there's something that happens in those situations, which is kind of incredible. And it happens not once, but again and again and again, right? So so it's it's kind of interesting to me that that uncertainty of a contingency is for me always um, that I never quite got over the HIV AIDS ep epidemic in that way. I'm That's really glad, glad that you didn't. And I love that you 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 invited us to there, Carlos, because this is something that was really, I'm going to use the word vital on purpose uh, in, in, for me about what the book is doing. I mean, early on, you you talk about struggling with what remains unintelligible. And then again, you're doing something really powerful in, in how expansively you're you're pushing us to, to understand media. But you say epidemic media are reflexive about their conjectural, provisional nature. I mean, it's right there. And you go on to say, and this is quite powerful, even though we'd rather turn our backs on pathogenic germs. And this is to your point, Carlos, like when stuff is befalling you and the state's not present, corporations could care less because they can't figure out how to monetize it yet. People have to show up for each other, right? Vishnu and mutual aid. And um, we have no option but to emerge with them, you say. And, and I didn't read any romance or even uh, naive optimism in that, obviously. It's 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 actually survival if we have to put it down to brass tacks. But, but also this possibility, maybe not a word you would have expected for this book, but of play. Like, and I think that that if if uncertainty can be full of terror, like the winds that are approaching across the ocean, Carlos, or, you know, or this thing that's still pulsing inside my body four years later, our body, this body, um, having a, a, the, a sense of curiosity. I was talking to my therapist about this last week. Like, what does it mean to approach chronic illness and disability with a sense of curiosity so that there's a little bit of room for imagination and play? I know so much about this because of the wisdom made inside of HIV, that pleasure did not go away, right? That isolation, physical, spiritual, emotional, political was deadly and need not only be. Um, that we could imagine all kinds of new ways, including all the things that people are taking before any of it had been run through a you know trial. And so uh, play is maybe a dangerous register for me to use because I know it can mean a lot of different things, but I think there's such an um, intellectual and political dexterity in your work, Bishnu. And I, I actually think, and I'm, I'm gonna sort of auto-essentialize as an artist, as a media maker, um, how important that is, especially in times of crisis, less fear lead only to rigidity or what we think we know, um, versus the emerging together that I think your, your work is, is reminding us we kind of don't have a choice. I mean, I guess we could pretend, but, um, and yet we have to be at the same time, having said all that, be reflexive, um, in the way that we emerge with one another and of course the any number of pathogens um and you remind us that they're they're trying to merge along right along with us too you know and there's going to be more coming um i want to toss back because carlos i know we're getting close to time and Vishnu, i feel like i i want to just 
I want to go get dinner and and touch on a whole bunch of things together. And just yeah, keep... I wish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you want to um, offer any other thoughts, um, Vishnu, maybe about the new book or um, or things that have arisen as we've been having this this conversation? Oh my God, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, Carlos brought up hurricanes. And I'm remembering how, you know, uh, Amitavo Ghosh's Great Derangement, the set of essays where he said, you know, I grew up hearing about storms in Bangladesh, you know, in the Delta, which was right near Calcutta. And uh, we were always told, oh, yeah, poor people always lose their homes in the monsoon. And this is Bangladesh. It's the fate of... Those were the first climate refugees, right? I mean, so, I mean, talk about not knowing. And I think I feel so ashamed now that I never recognized that. I mean, of course, we didn't have the language. I'm talking in the 1980s. We just didn't have the language. But still, you know, I think instinctually we knew about these things. Um, and so I uh, maybe, Pato, to end... I think I would say that the play thing is important because I think we're constantly, even your uh, your children, Carlos, to go back to how they think about fires, we're always composing things, you know, and there is a kind of an, and the more playful the aesthetics is, I think the more open-ended it is to, to this other, answer, to, to, to kind of give yourself over to play. You know, I, and I think there's something, there's an openness that play gives us that uh, that I think people used to thinking aesthetically know. Um, so even though we try to compose, we also leave it. So I, I, I know that doesn't quite get at what I'm trying to think of, but I, I'll just close it there. But I, yeah. I, um, I, I think a lot about... Um... Agar and particularly Derek Jarman's Bluey. I don't know why that why that film uh -huh. is coming to mind now. Um, because of the daring of of a film where you don't really see anything, you're 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 experiencing, or the the concept of a film where or art where that goes against what it's supposed to, what you assume it's going to do when you walk in the door. Um, and I think that. Um, that a lot of the way that we deal with that many of of the you know important artists of that of that first wave or AIDS um, art were dealing with with the sheer horror and trauma of loss and their their own seeing their own bodies sort of um, experience disintegration like you know David Rodnarovich and um, these other people. Where there is a kind of daring and uh, daring to look at what was going on in the face, in its face, um, and one of the things that strikes me as interesting here in thinking about your next project is that a lot of the um, it struck me that the pictures you're talking about air breath complex, and a lot of the pictures that we see are pictures of smoke or air itself and breath are air air you can't see technically right and breath results from the um encounter of differential temperatures that give you um i'm just throwing this out uh, here like when you're cold, then the the way you know somebody's the the somebody notice somebody's breath may be by when they're speaking, and that 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 hot air uh, condenses, and then you you see it right. So you're you're basically talking about something that that is almost that is absent at the outset, right? But that is also all around us and absolutely necessary for for the vital. And and it gives it and it gives that texture to even your definition of the vital that goes beyond that that is that is so intensively transitive right so so breath is that which really kind of has to be moving through everything um, in order for for life to even be possible so I I um, for whatever reason I, I I just I kept thinking about about those that the image of the the, the the decidedly unrepresentable nature of air and how you 
how you get to theorize breath in and through. It's a little bit like we're looking at negative shocks that give us a sense of what the work of breath is and what what air is supposed to be. Um, so we are at seven o'clock. <laughs> yes, um, it's it, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I I want to I want to thank you again, uh, Professor Ghosh, and and also uh, Professor Ebert for being with us tonight. Um, this has been um, delightful. We um, appreciate uh, your time and also really hoping that folks in the audience uh, get a chance to get a hold of this book. Um, I have it right here. Might as well do the little commercial thing uh, for the book. Uh, <laughs> available at, at any and all bookstores, I guess. Um, and um, uh, looking forward to see the work your work develop as this new project um, evolves. So I'll give you the closing, perhaps maybe 30 seconds to, to close the, the session. Um, Vishnu. Thank you for, for that. Yeah, I um, I was at another event where I forgot to bring my book. So thank you <laughs> for, for showing it. But really, it's it's been a pleasure because, you know, one of the things, um, what is a pleasure is I think what people get out of it because it was a thickly written book. It's a, a, almost a maverick book because it doesn't engage with one conversation. And so... I'm beginning to actually feel really enriched by the fact that I can have conversations like this from very different angles, you know, but approaching the same work. So I'm, I'm thank you very much for organizing this. And I, I'm hoping to continue to continue <laughs> with, with both of you uh, in the future. Thanks. Good Terrific. to see you. Patrick. Bye. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. And thank you in uh, particular to uh, the folks at the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice who make this possible, uh, Tanya Bentley and Dolores Turchi in particular. So thank you all and uh, good night. Good night. Good night.